Father, we come to you gracefully broken. All of us are fighting battles. All of us struggle. But you make all things possible within us. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in us. The same power exists in us. We just need to keep our eyes on Jesus. When we stumble, when we feel fallen and depressed, all we need to do is focus on him. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Talk to him like we talk. Talk to him like we talk to each other. He knows your heart. Father, we just thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness every morning we get up in a new day to try again. We thank you for the wonderful salvation, the free gift you gave us, which we'll be hearing more on today. We thank you for this church family that you've brought together, united as one to serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen. Well, first, uh, good morning and welcome uh, to our Southern Hills family and friends. Uh, we also like to say welcome to our guests uh, as uh, you have come to join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior. Um, and what a wonderful song that we just was blessed with here uh, about being gracefully broken by God. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school this morning, which Mr. John Patterson leads, that there's a difference between mercy and grace, but both of them are wonderful for us. And then when God gives us mercy, it is something that he does to us, for us, because we can't reach the standard which requires perfection. And then once we receive mercy through salvation, he gives us grace, grace that he works through us. You know, you remember Apostle Paul, he pleaded with God for we don't know what it was about that he was asking about. But that God would take some affliction, some shortcoming, whatever it may be, physical, mental, emotional, we don't know. He prayed three times that God would take this thing that afflicted him from him. That whatever it was may have stopped him from reaching this perfection in him. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. And we praise God that we serve a God that ins to ensure that we have mercy and grace that as we've gone through Luke's gospel, that we have seen that, that Jesus has died and he is now raised in all glory, that we may be justified, that our lives may be gracefully broken for his glory. And so we're in the last chapter of Luke and we've started a three-part sermon series uh, that is based on his resurrection, which is called Christ Lives. And last week, we spent part one uh, in those first sequence of events that happened after Jesus rose from the grave. Uh, we spent time in verses, chapter, verses 1 through 12, whereas those initial events were there were women who were followers to include Mary Magdalene and Johanna and some of them who went early to that tomb that Sunday morning. And what happens when they get there? Not only is the tomb empty, right, but also two angels from heaven descended upon them, Right. And these two angels had two objectives. These two angels had the first objective was to proclaim the resurrection, that he has risen, he is not here. The second objective was is to reassure them and re-exhort them in their faith. Because remember, they went there looking to find a body. How quickly do we forget the promises of God that he was going to rise from the grave? They came there to to put ceremonial perfumes on a corpse as if Jesus was going to be there, as if how quickly they have forgotten that he told them that he would rise on the third day. And so God, in his mercy and his grace, he sends a word by angels as a reassurance of their faith. And so the wonderful thing about Luke, he continues in these sequence of events we get to enjoy, right? As we go to uh, verses 13 through 35, which is the second part, uh, of our sermon, Savior Christ lives, is Jesus encounters two other followers who are making their way home to Emmaus. 
and all the things that happened between them that we get to look at, we get to learn from, and we get to be reassured and restored in our own faith. So that's where we're going to be today. So I ask you to stand if you can stand so we can read the word of God. We're going to be focused today, Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that have happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near them and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, and he said to them, this is the, com- this is the conversation, what, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, Cleopas, answered him, are you only a visitor into Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, this is Jesus, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen visions of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village which they were going, and he acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is not far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them, and the breaking of bread. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are the bread of life. That is only by a focus on you and a living through you that we are sustained and strengthened in our faith until you come again. We pray, Father Lord, as we look upon the record that you have given us in your grace and mercy of your resurrection. That you help us to learn and understand the deep riches, the spiritual truths of the text that we may not only learn it, but we may live it and do it, and that it will place a great joy within us. And so we just pray, Father, Lord, that you would help us to understand what is going on with the disciples, but to look upon you for truth, to look upon you for our promises forevermore. We pray this way, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. And so as we have been talking about the resurrection, one of the things that we pointed out time and time again is that one of the marks of a church, a body of faith, a community of faith for church, one of the, the healthy marks of a, a community of faith, one of the, of the signs of health in any preaching is the exaltation and the supremacy of the death 
in the resurrection of Christ. If you don't find those things in your sermons and amongst your community of faith, we have a problem. Because remember, the Bible is all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. That everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. And everything in the New Testament that testifies to us points back to him as the center of all creation, of all good, our Redeemer. And so as we have spent some time in the resurrection here, as we start to go through these last pages of Luke's gospel, central to the foundation of the Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Christ. And both of these events are inseparable as the redemptive plan of the Father is incomplete if it ends at the crucifixion, right? If it stops at the crucifixion, we have a problem. But the resurrection was also necessary for without it, our faith in God is pointless and we remain condemned. And Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 19, Pastor Norman read about this last Sunday. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then, there, then, the, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, in other words, those who we know who are believers who die from this earthly life, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all the people most to be pitied. But we praise be to God that even when Jesus walked the earth, that he prophesied at least three times that he would rise from the grave on the third day. And according to Luke, the disciples discovered this truth after a visit to the tomb on that third morning, only to find the tomb empty of the Lord. Now, unfortunately, instead of seeing these things, instead of being reaffirmed in their faith after seeing the visual evidence of what Jesus told them, the disciples leave the tomb hardened in unbelief. And now Jesus, our risen Savior, encounters two other followers returning to their hometown of Emmaus with their hearts burdened down with discouragement. And the prayer today is that this message will offer several uh, reflections, several reflections of Jesus' discussions with these men that should be both instructive and an encouragement to our faith. So as we've read through this kind of long passage here, what should be our first reflection? What should be our first takeaway as we see what Jesus does for them? Our first reflection point is that Jesus seeks out those who struggle in their faith. You see, all of us will have lapses of faith. All of us will have what some of the early church fathers would say, the dark night of the soul. All of us will have those days where we will question our faith. We don't understand because of what we experience, because of what we see, right? But the wonderful thing about God is that not all, he will never leave you there struggling in your faith, though you might tarry there for a while. And the part of our text, as we read here, we see two men, one named Cleopas, we don't know the name of the other, right, who are traveling back to their hometown of Emmaus after witnessing the horrific events of Jesus' crucifixion, right? They were there to watch him, you know, be scourged and then be, you know, humiliated and walk through the longest path to Jerusalem up to Calvary. They were there when they put the nails in his hands and his feet and they scoffed at him and all these various things. These are horrific events that they see and they've so quickly forgotten the promises of Christ's resurrection. And so as they make their way home to Emmaus, which is about, as Luke says, about seven miles from Jerusalem, so it's not far, right? What we see is an example of what you and I would call in our modern day culture that misery truly loves company, right? Misery loves company, right? And both men, they have suffered a lapse of faith in the promises of Christ, a lapse of faith. Why? Because without a hope in God's word, right, they have lost sight of what Jesus has plainly so said to them, all they have left. And that's how we are. When we forget what God has said, all they have left is to replay the events among each other. And as they keep talking about all the horrific things that have been said and that has happened without focusing on what God has said about Jesus' resurrection, here's what happens. It produces an increased erosion, erosion of their faith unto despair. That's why Luke says in verse 14, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Now, while they're in the midst of what we would also call a pity party, Jesus draws near them. Right. 
But the Bible says that they were kept from recognizing him, right? And Jesus drawing near these two men should remind us of what? That God not only pursues sinners, but his sheep who roam outside the sheepfold of his faith. He pursues. He truly is a God who will leave the 99 righteous behind and he will go and seek the one. The one. He will go seek the one. We preached on that months ago. Right? It's a wonderful thing about God. That to God, one of his people lost is unacceptable. That's not good math to him. He will have every person he has chosen to be with him in the new creation that he's established before the creation of the world. So God not only pursues sinners, but when we have lapses in faith, the time will come he will pursue you and I. Now, in our life of faith, we play an active role in that faith. We're not passive. There are some things that we do in an active lay, in, in our faith in God. We play an active role as well. But make no mistake, my friends, it is Jesus who gives faith. It is Jesus who sustains it, and it is Jesus who completes your faith, right? That's why Paul teaches, right? He has this confidence in God when he says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And further, you and I, we have the Bible. We have 2,000 years of church history. We have a cloud of witness of saints who have gone on before us, who have lived for God, right? That should, that should encourage us, that should inspire us as they are imperfect just like you and I, but they overcame what? Doubts. They overcame lapses in faith. They overcame struggles with indwelling sin. And they kept their eyes focused on God who will complete the task which he had willed for their life. They experienced the divine advocacy of God who not only must give you faith, he must sustain it, but he must keep it. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, it is seated where? At the right hand of the throne of God. That in our life of faith, we have an advocate. And so our first observation, our first reflection should be, as we look at what is happening to Cleopas and his companion, that Jesus seeks out those who struggles in their faith. He will not leave you there. The next thing we see as we start to go further in the text, as we read verses 16 through 24, we see how faith is eroded, right? Those two ugly twins I call doubt and despair, right? Doubt and despair does what? It leads to wavering faith, right? You remember how powerful doubt is. That's how we got this whole situation in the Garden of Eden in the first place, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden, right? They're in perfect harmony, perfection before God, right? And here comes Slewfoot, right? Here comes that snake, that ancient serpent, and he comes in there, and what does he use to get them to fall? It's not just disobedience that occurs. That's the outworking. But what does he use? Doubt. He says to them, did God surely say to you that you couldn't eat of this forbidden tree? No, you surely will not die. But he knows that if you eat of it, right? Y'all know the story, right? He so doubt, and all of a sudden they start to think that somehow God is holding something to get holding something from them. Right? And they fall to sin. And so you see here, when we don't believe what God says, if we don't take him at his word. Remember, when it comes to the matter of faith, it's not about how we feel. Right? We live in a culture where it's all about how we feel. It's not about how you feel. It's about what God has said. Because what God says overcomes and it transcends how you and I feel. That's why the saints, that's why Paul and Silas in the book of Acts, when they were beaten for spreading the gospel and whatnot and locked up in prison, they don't feel good at all. They were flawed, they in pain, they locked up in chains. But the Bible says because it was not about how they feel, but in the midnight hour they can be heard singing hymns to God, to God. They kept their eyes on Jesus. But I digress. We look at the text here, 
And the time has come for these two disciples, that's Cleopas and his companion, to experience the restorative power of Christ. Because as I said before, surely when we lose sight of Jesus and what he said, a lapse of faith is near. We'll be like Peter, right, who walked on water for a moment. Y'all remember him? Matthew 14, right? They're walking, you know, they're out, the disciples are in a boat, and they're struggling in the storm, and all of a sudden they see Jesus coming to them, walking on water. Now, Peter's the only one of them that have any measure of faith in Jesus in this moment. And he looks out on the water and he cries out to Jesus. He said, Lord, if it is you, tell, command me to come out of the water to you. And Jesus said to him, come, come. And he steps out on that water. He's not paying any attention to the wind and the waters. He is looking at his Lord and he walks on water towards Jesus. But see, here's the thing. We can be like Peter who walked on that water in that moment. But we can also suddenly sink in the waters of despair when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Because that's what happened to Peter. The Bible says he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to look at the winds. And he sank. And so we have to remember as we look at these things, one of them, uh, as Jesus draws near them, because he knows when we have a lapse of faith, Jesus should not be that far behind. Just keep praying, keep going to Christ, because Jesus will do it. And in our text, Jesus draws near these two men for the very moment to do what? To position himself to listen, to inquire as to what they were discussing, but ultimately to seize an opportunity to exhort them. And one of them, Cleopas, lays out the sequence of events that they've experienced the last couple of days. Now, the first thing Cleopas does is that he testifies that Jesus was a prophet of the Lord who was mighty in word and deed. He got a testimony right out of his mouth, even in the midst of despair, right? In other words, they saw and experienced the transformative work of Christ in his preaching and his life. They saw it. And such testimony is consistent of what is said about the Messiah in both the Old Testament and the New the second thing Cleopas does is that he places the blame for Jesus' demise, demise for his crucifixion rightly on the chief priests and the rulers, right? Now, they wasn't the only people involved in Jesus' crucifixion, right? There were others. Remember, there was a crowd there going, crucify him, crucify him of the Jews. You know, remember, they exchanged Jesus for a murderer that is Barabbas, right? We also remember that the Roman government was involved in all this with Pontius Pilate. Right, that they used to have him scourged and, brutal, and scourged and put him on a brutal trial and had him crucified. Right? But Cleophas understood that the heavier guilt rested with the chief priests and the rulers of the Jews. He understood that. You know, even Peter makes this same note when, you know, Jesus at this point, this is in the book of Acts now, Acts chapter 3. Right? You know, Jesus already ascended back to heaven and they're out spreading the gospel by the power of the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 3, the Bible says that Peter and the apostles come into Solomon's portico area, and they heal a man who's lame, a lame beggar, right? And when the multitude see this, right, they start gathering around because they've seen this miracle. And Peter, rightly, what does he do? He takes the opportunity to preach the gospel. But he takes the same posture about who is truly responsible for the fall and the crucifixion of our Lord, as Cleopas does. So in Acts chapter 3, Verses 13 through 18, Peter says that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer, Barabbas that is, to be granted to you. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, and to this we are witness. And in, in his name, by faith in his name, he has made this man, that is the lame beggar, strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man the perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as also did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. And so you see, Peter has the same understanding. And on this day, even in the heart of despair, Cleopas lays the blame rightly on the chief priests 
and the rulers of the Jews. Another thing that Cleopas does is that, which I can really appreciate, is that he's honest about his own bewilderment, their own dash hopes for Christ. Because remember, they had these earthly hopes for Jesus, right? Earthly hopes of Jesus. The text says in verse 21, it says, but we had hoped that he would be, that he was to be the one to redeem Israel, right? Remember, the Jews had different ideas of what the Messiah was as they misinterpreted the Old Testament scriptures about him, right? You know, they had hoped that he was going to be this earthly political king who will overthrow their bondage to Rome and restore Israel to a prominence on the world stage, right? And they were so convinced of this at one point, if you go to John's gospel in John chapter 6, they were going to come and make Jesus king by force, by force. But that's not what Jesus came to do. That's not what he came to do. And we know when we understand, we observe the Gospels that this mindset continued, right? Even in Luke 19, for example, when Jesus comes in for his last week of life, which we call the week of the passion, right? He comes in riding a donkey's colt as prophesied by Zechariah now. Remember we talked about that? And he comes in and does he come in in silence? No. They line the roads and they worship him. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus understood even with all this worship of him, they misunderstood who he really was. And therefore, right after they did that, the Bible says Jesus stands over the horizon of Jerusalem and he weeps. He weeps about their unbelief because they have not understood him or the time of his appearing. And bottom line, this stuff is still in the disciples' heart as well. And so imagine having this mindset about Jesus, that he's some earthly king or ruler, because we got the same problem in our American culture today. We're still looking for a king when you have a king. That is Jesus who rules over the church. But back then, same problem, same thing going on. Imagine having this mindset that even whatever Jesus is saying, I still have this hope that he's going to make us great in the earth. But all of a sudden they watch the Jews, the rulers of the Jews, you know, come together to kill him. They watch him be scourged and flogged. They watch him be dragged and humiliated through the Jerusalem, the longest path to Jerusalem, and him barely make it. They watch him be nailed to the cross. They watch them mock him as he's up there. Surely if he is the son of God, save himself and come down the cross if he would have him. They heard all this stuff. Imagine all your hopes and this twisted view of who Jesus is. And he says these words, Father, into, my, into your spirit, I give up my spirit. Imagine him saying, imagine watching all your hope die with him on the cross. Imagine. Because they didn't believe when he said he would rise from the grave. And so he is rightly in despair. But we are glad that he was transparent, even though he didn't know that he was talking to Jesus. And lastly, Cleopas described the women. There's some of them are Mary Magdalene, Johanna, some of them we, they are mentioned in Scripture. There's a group of believers who was among the disciples with Jesus who went to the tomb and found it empty that morning. And in their excitement, they rushed to give their testimony to the disciples, which was not received well. As a matter of fact, Luke records that when the disciples heard the women's testimony, it seemed like idle tales, sheer nonsense to them, Right? And even after they went to the tomb, because remember the Bible says that Peter and some of them went to the tomb. They went to check it out, right? And, but they found it just as the women said, but this still did not bring forth belief. And Cleopas testified that they were amazed at all this. Why? Because they did not believe that Jesus' word that he would rise from the grave on this third day. And so how do we recover from a lapse of faith? How do we, you know, we make our return back and be restored in God? The next reflection is simply is that faith is strengthened and restored by a refocus on the word of God. Not a show, not smoke and fog lamps and all this other stuff and people saying God has a wonderful plan for your life. No, no. it is restored by a refocus on this is what God has said, right? This is what God has said. And so as we look at our text, even the risen Savior who walks among them, they still are not believing. And so Jesus, what must he do now as he's with Cleopas and his companion? He must rebuke their unbelief, and he must remind them of what the word says concerning him, right? 
And only by refocus on the word of God can our faith be restored and refreshed. Thus, Jesus begins his exhortation. Verse 25 to 26, Jesus says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Right? See, too often, the Jews only focus on the victory of the Messiah. They like those scriptures, right? While ignoring the fact that the scriptures taught that the path to such victory would be through suffering, right? In a similar place, that's kind of what we do today, in, in, uh, especially in American Christianity. We like to uh, emphasize the love of God, right? And then even when we do that, we have redefined what the love of God really is. It's not even biblical. OK, and then we like to minimize. We don't want to talk about sin. We don't want to talk about the judgment and the righteousness. We don't want to talk about the wrath of God, which all these are found in the same God, in the same God. So we can identify with the Jews want to hear the good news and try to ignore some of the bad news. Right. And so Jesus says to them, oh, foolish ones, slow in heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And how quickly they had forgotten that the Messiah, that the way to glory is through suffering. Now, we remember, I talked about this earlier, remember the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, right? They ate from the forbidden tree. We also remember our adversary, the devil's role in their fall, right? You know, remember, they eat from the tree, right? And what happens to the creation? Sin and death comes in through who? Adam, not Eve, Adam, right? Comes into the creation. Now they see that they're naked, which they didn't understand that before, and they hide themselves from God. And the Bible says God could be heard walking in the floor of the garden. And he confronts them about what has happened and what they have done, and he exercises judgment on Adam, then Eve, but then he turns his attention to the devil or what the Revelations calls that ancient serpent. And in meeting out judgment on the devil, on that ancient serpent, he spoke of the coming Messiah and his suffering. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 through 15 says, And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat, all the days of your life, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's hostility. Enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, before the Messiah's glorious victory, right, the woman seed that is Jesus must suffer to win and to rescue a chosen, elected community of faith from the serpent's dominion. Remember before Christ, were well, either two types of children in this life. There are only two. We're either a child of wrath or we are a child of God. And all of us, if we've been in Jesus, we've all been child of wrath. We've all been child's sons of destruction. That's what Paul would say, Right? But Paul also says this words. He says, through Jesus' suffering, he snatches all those who belong to him out of the clutches and the dominion of Satan and places us into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, he says that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have what? Redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And this is why Jesus reminds Cleopas and his companion that it was what? Necessary, right? It was necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. Because here's the truth. If he does not suffer, if he does not die, you and I do not live. We do not live. You and I would have no glory to share with him in the new creation. And so Luke continues. And so you see Jesus continues in his exhortations, and he uses a strategy, which we should take note of, that how Jesus combated the devil before, right? Remember in Luke chapter 4, for example, the Bible says that the spirit, you know, he gets baptized by John the Baptist first, right? 
And then the Bible says that the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. And what does old Slewfoot do? He don't come on day one and two. He come at the very end when he's tired and hungry. How many times has the devil attacked you when you're exhausted and tired? That's when we become more vulnerable. That's when we need to be praying or be in our word so we can be shielded from some of those things. But he waits to the end and he comes and he tempts Jesus with all these things. And how does Jesus respond to the devil? With the word of God. He says, it is written. It is written. It is written. Right? Now, as we come back to our focus text, you're going to see Jesus use this same strategy to deal with doubt and despair that also has its source for my adversary. Right? And so Jesus does likewise, and he offers them a refresher course on the word. Verse 27, he says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, uh, inter interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus goes back to the word. So when you and I are having issues and we're struggling with various things, God is always going to take you back to his word because his word is life. Right. His word is a light in the darkness, a true light in the darkness. He's always going to take you back to the word. And he does that to them on this day. And so they have many examples in the Old Testament about who Jesus was, what he was going to do, and that he was going to live, that he was going to suffer the cross, and that he was going to rise from the grave. All sorts of prophecies and testimonies about Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, Pastor Norman read Jeremiah 23, where it talks about Jesus going to come, who come from the line of David, right? That true good shepherd to lead his people. You have a Moses when he walked with the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. He says these words to the children of Israel. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. And it is to him you shall listen. Right? The Psalms, if you read the Psalms, they have a lot to say about the Messiah, right? So, for example, David, he highlights in Psalm chapter 2 that the worlds of men, what they're going to do, they're going to make an alliance against the Messiah, right, to attempt to destroy him, right? So David says in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, he says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers, they take counsel together. Where do we see that fulfilled? and Pontius Pilate, and Herod, and then the rulers of the Jews, right? They colluded together to put away Jesus. They take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And we have many prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. One who spoke the most about Jesus in the Old Testament is the prophet Isaiah, Right? And we talked about Isaiah 53 as we've gone through the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life. You notice that we referenced Isaiah 53 quite a bit. And then finally, maybe a couple of months back, we did a sermon on Isaiah 53 so that we can understand the richness of what Isaiah was saying about the what? The suffering servant, right? Even in the Jewish Hebrew Bible right now, they have attempted to eliminate Isaiah 53 from their Bible, from their Bible. But that's a whole nother subject for a whole nother time. But Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, verse 3, he says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And we can be here forever. I can go on for another hour going through systematically. Then Pastor Noble can come up here another hour, and we can go through all the prophecies and all these things that speak about Jesus. I got a one hand up saying, let's do it. Okay, we'll do it. Arby's can wait. Arby's can wait. Okay, <laughs> amen. So let's continue. So the next reflection point is to remember in your walk with God that faith is strengthened. It is restored by a refocus on the word of God. That's why you need brothers and sisters in Christ. You cannot, you know, uh, being a Christian is not, is not like a man being on the island by himself. That's not a lone venture, Right? You need, God has given you a community. And sometimes, even when you cannot pray yourself, even when you just, you don't even want to open your Bible, call your sister in Christ, call your brother in Christ, and they will pray and be with you, pray with you. 
It's not a lone man vision, but you need to refocus on the word of God. The next reflection point, as we're going to this last couple of verses of our focus text, as we see what Jesus does to them, that faith is only restored by an encounter with Christ, right? Now, we can go in all sorts of places. A lot of times we go do a lot of other things that we think we need to lift ourselves up in our spirit. How long that lasts? How long that lasts? And sometimes it's going to have some activity going, doing something, but eventually that's going to be over. Right. Sometimes some of us, you know, like myself, you know, I, I, you know, I comfort eat. when I get real depressed and down, I just start eating things. OK, you know, but how long is going to last? OK, but ultimately, if you want something that's going to sustain you, that is going to lift you up out of the mire of doubt and despair, you need Jesus. You need an encounter with the Lord. And so now the two companions here, now they have been in the presence of God. They have been given the refresher, of course, on the scriptures that the, Jesus has opened their understanding so they can see what the Bible says about him. And as they look at Jesus, because again, they don't recognize him yet, they could not have get enough of him to the point that they were enamored with him. And as I said before, the Bible says they still don't recognize him yet, but they know something's different about him. And so Luke says in the text, as Jesus is kind of done with them, he's just keeping going. But the Bible says they did not want him to depart and inclined him to remain with them that evening. And the text says that it was in the breaking of bread that they finally recognized him. That the spirit was aflame with heaven's light within them, right? Just the breaking of bread and their eyes are open and they see Jesus for who he truly is. Why? Not because that they're special. They are special to God. It's because God made it so. God made it so through the breaking of bread. They can see him. And the Bible says that he vanished before their sight. Now, that's a picture of, a, of our glorified body, but that's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. Right? Coming in and out of walls. And I always say, I praise the Lord that Jesus ate. Amen. Still going to eat in heaven. But some of you are not going to be happy about this, that we're probably going to be vegans in heaven. But anyway, that's a whole other subject for a whole other day. <laughs> but nevertheless, the point is, is that the, the spirit was aflame, was burning with them by being with Jesus. Verse 32 says, is that they say with amongst themselves, when Jesus vanishes from their sight, they say, did, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And as a Christian, you should have these moments with God. Those moments where you're going to him, you're praying about things, you're praying about things, you're reading certain scriptures, right? That's why I say keep reading. You're not going to understand everything in the Bible when you read, but read it. Read it. There is a consuming what God is saying, and then eventually understanding will come. What does it mean? And you know that feeling when it happens, when the Spirit finally opens your understanding to a part of scripture you've been reading for five years. I have read that scripture so many times, and now the Spirit has to give you understanding, and it's like something burning up in your bones. And this is what they're experiencing. Remember, they walked with Jesus how long? Three years. They heard all these words. But now they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? In other words, our faith will burn afresh and be steadfast in the presence of God before his word. And it's only by faith that we can shield ourselves from the fiery arrows that Satan shoots at, shoots at us, right? So Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, what does he talk about there? He talks about us putting on what? The full armor of God. And one of those armors is what? The shield of faith. And on the other hand, we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we hold that thing up and while faith in Jesus. Why? Because it shields us from the fiery arrows of the devil when he shoots despair and doubt and lies at you and I. One of our great our issues with doubt and our issues with sin often centered on one thing, a lie that we believe from the devil. A lie. And the word must come in because it must change and give us the truth so that we can change our mind. And this is a warfare that we as Christians should engage in continually in all circumstances looking upon Jesus. Looking upon Jesus. So no matter what is happening into your life, never give up praying. 
Never give up going before your word. I always tell Christians, when you're praying, Bible should be open. Bible should be open. Read, pray, come be with the saints. You can't do Christianity by yourself in your house, right? Come be with the saints. That's a part of your spiritual growth. Come, serve, come be a part. You don't realize how much of your wonderful personality that we miss here in the church when we don't see you, when we don't see you. And I'm not talking about all the things we like, even some of our most stubbornness about ourselves, right? That's what brings us together as a family. That is a means of grace for you and I to grow together. And so we come because those things strengthen us in faith. And as we look at Cleopas and his companion, you can see now what has happened. Right? They say that did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? You see that Jesus didn't just leave him out there absent of his identity, but he makes himself known of exactly who it is he's talking to and with the breaking of bread. And so now with their faith restored, they believe the testimony of the women. Because remember, it was women who were first to believe. Right? They were the first to the tomb. Right? They had to have help too. Right? The father had to send how many angels? Two. Two from heaven. But it doesn't matter that he sent two angels. It's what the angels had to say. Right? It's the message that they carried. Right? They said to him, he has risen. He is not here. Remember what he told you when he was in Galilee that he would rise from the grave on the third day. That's what's important. That's what's important. But God knew they needed that help. You and I need help. And so now Jesus comes up. And he presents himself to these two disciples all before he actually goes to the 11. And so now they believe with their faith restored, with their memory refreshed of what Jesus has said, they return. I remember what Luke says, how far is Emmaus from Jerusalem? Seven miles, right? So the Bible says it's late in the evening. They go back that same night. You know, now they didn't have Ubers and all that other stuff that we had then. I don't know how quickly it took them to get there seven miles, but they went back that night because they need to tell the disciples right away. And the two men, they go, they tell the other disciples their testimony, but the Bible says the disciples still disbelieve. They didn't believe him, right? You know, you even have in our Gospels where you have one of our disciples, we call him Doubt and Thomas. Y'all know him, right? You know, Jesus appears to some of the disciples, not some other ones, and he still doesn't believe. He said, well, unless I see the holes in his hand and the piercing in his side, I won't believe, right? And again, he needs Jesus. It's okay for us to be humble to know I need Jesus so I can have faith. I need Jesus so I can continue to believe, right? And what does Jesus do when he appears behind a locked door? He comes right up to Thomas and says, see my hands. See my hands. Put your hand there. Put your hand on my side. Stop being disbelieved, right? Wonderful part. Because Don Thomas is just you and I. You know, if you look at every disciple, our lives are scattered in all of them, Right? But you look at Cleopas and his companion, they go get their testimony, they still not believe. Why? Because the wonderful thing about this text is not so much the lapse of faith, because we'll have them, is that Jesus, not that he may, he will step in. Remember, he is the author and what? Finisher of our faith. And now what has happened to the women, what has happened to Cleopas and his companion, the disciples must now see Jesus. Right? And we're going to experience that and part three next Sunday, right? The last portion of Luke's gospel, where he will now appear to the 11. He will restore their faith, and this small group of smelly fishermen, a despised tax collector, they will set the world on fire for the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you have promised us that though you ascended back to heaven, that you will never leave us, never forsake us. And we can trust your word because you said it. And your ways are perfect. Your ways are true. And everything you speak, it will be done. And so we just pray, Father, Lord, that you would help us because we struggle with many things in this life, especially in the things that go on in our world. In our lives, Heavenly Father, we have so many experiences, so many things we see that seem to just conflict with what we know that your word says. But help us to trust you 
over our experiences, but to know that you don't dismiss our experiences, to know that you understand exactly what we go through, that you were present in all things that have happened to us, and that you are working all things, both good and most, and even unfavorable things that happen in our life for your glory and for our good. And we can trust that those things will take place because you said it. And we've seen you live it in our lives. And so we just pray, Father, Lord, that you would build us up in faith and strengthen us. Help us to trust you in all areas of life to surrender those things to you. But help us to grow in grace, to grow in grace, to understand even as we strive for perfection, we will never attain perfection on this side of heaven. But that your grace is sufficient for broken people. And that you are in the business of taking small shattered pieces and put them together for your glory. That is us. So we thank you, Father. We honor, we glorify you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.